now. All right. Good morning and good afternoon. Welcome to another episode of Before Coffee. We are here on Thursday, and we've got some big news coming out of Russia. And we're going to find out if there's going to be any big news coming out from the rest of the world. So let's go ahead and start with our news stories here on Before Coffee. Today, okay, here. Today on Before Coffee. Russian court extends detention of WSJ reporter Evan Gerskovich. India lands a probe on the moon's south pole. Biden points finger at Putin as Pergozin's reported deaths seen as warning to elites. Hurricane season is here in the U.S. and it's already record setting. Bricks to admit six new countries to block, including Iran and Saudi Arabia. And we spin the squeal of fortune to find out all of the names and stories of all of Trump's co-conspirators today on Maryland Day, August 24th, 2023, on Before Coffee. Okay, first new dazed. story. We're definitely talking about Pergozin. But it's the only story I found on The Guardian anyways, which is what I'm using for my new Pergozin, story. Pergozin, we barely know. It's on, is also about Biden, because I guess Biden is instigating the idea that Pergozin was not killed by accident. Who could have ever oh, thought? He, Russians killing people, <laughs> not on accident. What a concept. Not exactly, not exactly a novel idea. I don't think Biden came yeah. up with it. Anyway. But first, let's talk about Russians in a different context, because they like to put their put journalists in jail for trying to report the, the facts instead of propaganda. This is from Peter Sawyer on The Guardian. A Moscow court has extended the detention of the Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gerskovich, who was arrested on espionage charges at the end of March, probably for reporting something that happened. During a brief, don't tell people that happened. How dare you? That's secret state information that we suck or whatever. I don't remember what he reported on. During a brief hearing on Thursday, <laughs> the court ordered Gersh Gersh Gershkovich to remain in jail until the 30th November. Russian news agency reported his pretrial detention had initially been scheduled to expire next week. He is being held in a notorious left Fort Ovo prison in Moscow and could face a sentence of up to 20 years if found guilty. The case is still in a stage of investigation with with the no date for the trial set. Thursday's hearing was closed to the public. Gershkovich, Gershkovich, 31, is the first American journalist to be held in Russia on spy charges since the end of the Cold War, which really never ended if you think about it. He was detained in the Ural city of Ekaterinburg while reporting on a reporting trip at the end of March. Russia's SFB security service has claimed he was collecting state secrets about the country's military industrial complex. He's probably reporting on how these poor kids are being conscripted and they're, you know, they don't want to fight for Russia. He's probably doing something like that. And they're like, don't you they're dare spread mothers. false propaganda that Russians don't want to fight for Russia. How dare you? Every Russian is a proud Russian. We have no dissent in our ranks. Something Even like in that. Ukraine. Yeah. He's happy to kill Ukrainians because they're traitors to the country. Yersovich was the Wall Street Journal and the Wall Street Journal have denied the charges. Early in August, the U.S. Ambassador to Russia, Lynn Tracy, made her third visit to Gersh Gershkovich and reported that he appeared to be in good health despite challenging circumstances. It has been widely speculated that Russia arrested Gershkovich in our hope of trading him for Russian intelligence officers or other people of interest to Moscow arrested in Western countries. But so far, there appears to have been little progress in, discuss in discussions over a possible exchange. U.S. officials have indicated they see a prisoner exchange with Moscow as the most likely path for them to win freedom for Gershkovich. 
whom they deemed to be wrongfully detained. Last month, the U.S. President Joe Biden said he was serious about pursuing a prisoner exchange for Gershkovich and claimed the process was underway. The Kremlin has also suggested it could be open to a possible prisoner exchange involving Gershkovich, but said such talks must be held away from the public eye. The journal earlier reported that Putin held direct oversight over the detention of Gershkovich, receiving video briefings before and after his arrest by the SFSB's counterintelligence service. Another American, the Michigan corporate security executive Paul Whelan, has been in prison in Russia since December 2018 on espionage charges that has found in the U.S. government have called baseless. So I guess they're trying to say expect Hershkovich to be in prison a very long time because they still haven't helped Paul Whelan, who's also been before the war even started, but since Crimea, basically. Well, actually, after Crimea. After Crimea, this guy's been in jail and nothing has been done. Or no, there's no been, been whole, no help. And I don't even know how long espionage charges go for. That hasn't been indicated at all. So, you know, he could be in jail for 20 years for life because of espionage. And unless the U.S. can expedite him or whatever, uh, there's no, nothing for him. I'm, I hope, I'm hoping he keeps his hopes up, uh... Because if once he loses hope, it's over for him in prison, I guess. So I'm sure there's a lot of other people in there are, who, who are there and on bogus charges. So hopefully he has some yep. sort of camaraderie in prison. Yeah, I'm here too. Off on the gulags. Yeah, Let's Putin see. said I freaking insulted his children or something. So now I'm stuck in prison for 20 years. Uh, yeah. Your story. Oh, okay. So well, the new feature. One. A new feature, at least we're going to have that while there's uh, still co-defendants in this case, is going to be called the, the Squeal of Fortune. I almost said wheel. The Squeal of Fortune. <laughs> which, uh, you're going to spin the wheel here in a minute, and I'm going to pick which of Trump's co-defendants we're going to cover t in today's third news story. And by the way, Donald Trump is surrendering today, where he's getting a mugshot. Mugshot nice. and fingerprints. So we're gonna have a mugshot, but not today. Maybe tomorrow we'll put it up. Big old mugshot. We have a Rudy mugshot. He got arrested yesterday. As the co-defendants, yeah, they started turning themselves in. They all have till tomorrow, or they're gonna be arrested. We went and things were bad boys, bad boys were to kick in the door, you know. Yeah. And all the cameras are there. But uh, Rudy was among the people that turned themselves in yesterday. Played bond and went home. Hundred and fifty thousand dollars. But you know, you want to spin the wheel? Yep. Wheel's on the screen. You don't have to read all the names, but we just gotta spin the wheel. So all right, we're spinning the wheel. Am I gonna be able to see it? No, I guess not. Go ahead. I'll tell you what it says. All We've right, let's see it. Yuskis Tavares. Yuskis Tavares. Yes. Ah. Uh, May I pronounce that wrong, but hey, we're going to look that name up while you read your next story. And now on to my first story. My first story is India. Remember earlier this week where Russia failed to land? Their moon a, landing? Their moon, moon probe? The moon landing? And we mentioned India was doing this, basically the same thing. Well, India's works. This is from Reuters. Yeah, I know. Third world Reuters. country here. <laughs> well, speaking of embarrassing... We're going to try to read this reporter's name. All righty. <laughs> this is an Indian reporter, so no slurs intended. Nivedita Bata Charji. Yeah, I'm not going to ever try to read that again, but that's what it looks like to me. It's really, it's like this long. An Indian spacecraft became the first to land on the rugged, unexplored south pole of the moon on Wednesday in a mission seen as crucial to the lunar exploration of India's standing as a space power. Just days after a similar Russian lander crashed. The moment is unforgettable. It's phenomenal. This is a cry of... This is a victory cry of a new India, said Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Who wait? Or is it Modi? Is it Modi? Who waved the Indian flag? I'm Modi, so we'll just go with Modi. Okay. With Modi. Who waved the Indian flag as he watched the landing of the South from South Africa, where he's intending the BRICS summit, a group that joins Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. 
And he can rub it in Russia's nose, but Putin's not there in person, so Because he's bad. too scared of being arrested, like a little bit. Oh, that's right. He, he's a war criminal in South Africa. Yeah. Which is, <laughs> I, it just, it's got to be awkward. Where's the war criminal? Scientists and officials clapped, cheered, and hugged each other as the spacecraft landed and people across India broke out in celebration, setting off firecrackers and dancing in the streets. India's on the moon, said S. Samanath, chief of the Indian Space Research Organization, ISRO, as the Chandrayaan-3 landed, making India the fourth nation to successfully land a spacecraft on the moon after the United States, China, and the former Soviet Union. You know, as they say that Russia hasn't done it, but the yeah. Soviet Union has. It was the ISR... entire conglomeration of the Soviet Union That's that right. helped do it. So. Lithuania was part of that, you know? Yeah. IS ISRO shared pictures from the spacecraft showing the moon's surface. And, and, a, and a lot of the astronauts are Ukrainian, by the way. Moon surface and leg and shadow of the lander. Rough terrain makes a South Pole landing difficult, but the region is ice could supply fuel, oxygen, and drinking water for future missions. Russian President Vladimir Putin congratulations, congratulated India on a message to Modi published in the Kremlin website. This is a big step forward in the space exploration and of course, of, and of course a testament in the impressive progress made by India in the field of science and technology. NASA Administrator Bill Nelson con congratulated the RSRO on the landing. And congratulations to India on being the fourth country to successfully soft land a spacecraft on the moon. He said on Twitter, we're glad to be your partner on the mission. This was India's second attempt to land a spacecraft on the moon, and it comes less than a week after Russia's Luna 25 mission failed. People across the country were glued to the television screens and said prayers as a spacecraft approached the surface. Nearly 7 million watched the YouTube live stream. Wow. Chander, Chandrayaan means moon vehicle in Hindi and Sanskrit. In 2019, ISIO's Chandr, Chandrayaan 2 mission successfully deployed an orbiter, but its lander crashed. Chandrayaan 3 is expected to remain functional for two weeks, running a series of experiments, including a spectrometer analysis of the mineral composition of the lunar surface. The moon rover will take a few hours a day to come out of the spacecraft. Samantha told reporters, adding that the landing has given India confidence to extend its reach, possible voyage to Mars and Venus, more un more uninteresting places. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> India is also planning to launch a mission in September to study the sun. Sam Sam Samanath said, "Yep, the sun's still there, and it's easy to find." Ace. A human spaceflight is also planned, and while no official date has been announced, preparations are likely to be ready for 2024. The landing is expecting to boost India's reputation for cost-competitive space engineering. The Chandrayaan-3 was launch of the budget of about 6.5 billion rupees, which is only 74 million less. I'm oh, sorry, it's seven more. Let's do this again. 6.1. 5 billion rupees less than the cost to produce the 2013 Hollywood space thriller Gravity. So it costs less than a movie. Okay. <laughs> it costs less than a movie. Landing on the South Pole would actually allow Lindy Explore India to explore if there is water ice on the moon, if there's very important cumulative data in science and the geology of the moon, said Carla. Philo Tico, a partner and managing director of consulting space tech partners. Anticipation before the landing was feverish with banner headlines across India, newspapers and news channels running countdowns to the landing. Prayers were held at places of worship across countries. School children were waved the Indian tricolor as they waited for live screenings at the landing. Children gathered at the banks of the Ganga, Ganga River, considered holy by the Hindus to pray for a safe landing and moss softer prayers in a Sikh temple known as a guard Duwara in the capital of New Delhi, Petroleum Minister Hardeep Singh Puri also offered prayers, not just economic, but Indiana achieving scientific and technological progress as well. So, so there you go. They're spending a lot of money to do stuff that we did before to gather information. It's a pride thing at this point, but at some point they're going to be saying, what are we going to the sun for? We've already studied the sun for centuries, you know.
Just trying and to prove that a country that isn't, you know, a huge military nation can also achieve scientific progress, well, they did I guess. Nuclear weapons, too. They didn't nuclear yeah. weapons, so. Even though I yeah, believe so. India actually historically, through an like ancient civilization, helped invent a lot of technology. But of course, they don't get the credit for that because they're brown. So. Oh, this. I, I read this story yesterday when it first came out, like a, when it was new, and there was a guy in the message and he was going, This is a fake story. And yeah. I, this is fake. It this has not been reported view. on the. Yeah, this hasn't been reported on the U.S. news channels. This is a fake story. So I went to Google News and there was like 500 stories covering it. It's like, how's, yeah, it's a fake story, Moran. Just the dumbest people in this country, I swear. Just in they denial don't hear from Fox that news. other countries can do anything that they can do, right? America's not great. The people who they think deserve. like that genuinely believe if anybody can do something the same as them, they've lost all of their greatness, right? Yeah, it's ego. They call it the zero sum game. Yeah. I can't, the other, the neighbor can't achieve without me failing. Exactly. Yeah. The dumbest people on our planet. And they all vote for some reason. Maybe they don't. They'll forget to vote. You just tell them <laughs> the day is the wrong day and they'll forget to vote. They're that stupid. They really are. You You're just sorry. tell them it's a I'll conspiracy was, to vote and then they'll believe you. I'll be looking at that name you gave me. I'm sure I can. <laughs> Yuski, Yuski Tavros. Got, yeah. Oh, I got it. I got it. I just yeah. got open the web, the web page. I All right. Well, you look up post. your your story about our conspirators. Let's look yeah. into a conspiracy of its own. This is from Graham Russell and agencies at The Guardian. Biden points fingers at Putin as Pergozin's reported death seen as a warning to elites. Joe Biden has strongly suggested Vladimir Putin's involvement in the apparent death of Yevgeny Prigozhin is in a plane crash as Ukrainians official interpreted the incident as a warning to Russian elites and flowers were laid for the late Wagner chief outside the organization's St. Petersburg headquarters. I don't know for a fact what happened, but I'm not surprised, the U.S. president said after a brief briefing after the crash of Prigozhin's private jet between Moscow and St. Petersburg. Just one stray anti-air missile Beep, out of the sky. It's not been much, I mean, it's not like we'll ever see the records of the crash, right? Uh, there's been, we have found missile residue on the outside of the explosive from the external, like, we're not going to get a report on the crash. They're just going to say, plane crashed. All right, Dead cover people. it up. Don't need any more additional information. Um, whether or not it is a conspiracy or not, we'll never know. Hmm. There's not much that happens in Russia that Putin's not behind, but I don't know enough to know the answer. Rosa, Rosa Vyastya, the Russian Aviation Authority, said Pergozin and senior Wagner commander Dmitry Utkin were among 10 people traveling on an Embraer business jet that crashed on Wednesday evening. The cause of the crash was not immediately clear, but Pergozin's long-standing feud with the military and the armed uprising he led in June would give the Russian state ample motive for revenge. Ukrainian presidential aide me make halo Podolyak said the plane crash on wednesday evening exactly two months after wagner's forces marched on moscow was a signal from putin to russians elite ahead of the 2024 election beware disloyalty equals death those sentiments were echoed by the russian journalist ksenia sobchak whose father putin was described as his mentor absolutely clear signal to all the elites in the fact to everyone who had er any seditious thoughts, she said on Telegram. The Kremlin has not yet commented on the crash. Rosa Vyastya, the Russian avian authority, said Prigozhin and senior Wagner commander Dmitry Utkin were among the ten traveling on the jet at the time. Putin himself made no mention of the incident during a speech in Moscow to mark the 80th anniversary of the victory of the Battle of Kursk during the Second World War. He instead hailed all our soldiers are fighting bravely and, and resoutly in Ukraine. On the ground in Russia is a building house oh, in Russia a building housing Wagner's offices in St. Petersburg lit up its windows on Wednesday in such a way as to display a giant cross and a mark of respect in mourning. Flowers were left and candles lit near the offices early on Thursday. The future role of Wagner, which once played a prominent role in war in Ukraine and is active in Africa, remains unclear. Abbas Galyamov a former Putin speechwriter turned critic said, The establishment is not convinced that it will 
not be possible to oppose Putin, who is strong enough and capable of revenge. Bill Browder, Browder, a businessman with years of experience in Russia and another Kremlin critic, agreed. Putin never forgives and never forgets. He looked like a humiliated weakling with Progozin running around with a, without a care in the world after the mutiny. This will cement his authority. Well, he wasn't running around the world. He was running around Russia without a care in the world. I don't see how Progozin thought, oh yeah, there's no way this guy will try to get me killed. And just flew around in Russia. But I guess he didn't <laughs> want to cement his fuel treasonous acts by like actually leaving the country, right? Hubris. Yeah, I guess. He's Ukrainian... been through so many battles and not killed, he figured, ah, you know, I'm invincible. I'm a rough and tough um, freaking mercenary. What do I care? Right. Ukrainian ministerial advisor Anton Garoshenko suggested Wagner mercenaries may seek revenge against Putin and Russia's military establishment, with whom Prigozhin clashed repeatedly, and implied on social media that any other parliamentary leaders linked to Putin may feel at risk including a picture of Ramzan Kadyrov, the strongman head of Chechnya, who forces have been fighting in Ukraine. Bill Svetlana Sihanouskaya, the exiled leader of the opposition of Belarus, where some Wagner fighters moved after the short-lived mutiny in Russia, said Prigozhin would not be missed in her country. He was a murderer and should be remembered as such, she said. Prigozhin's mm -hmm. apparent demise coincides with the removal of one of the Wagner founders' key allies in the Russian military, General Sergei Sorovkin. The commander was rumored to have been put under house arrest, interrogated, and even put in the notorious Lefortovo prison. His whereabouts has not been confirmed publicly. Sorovkin's ousting was the highest level of sacking of a military commander after Prigozhin's abortive mutiny in June. Polish Foreign Minister Zimbianyu Rao on the state news channel TVP Info has said we would have great trouble naming anyone who would intuitively think this was a coincidence. It so happens that political opponents whom Vladimir Putin considers a threat to his power do not die naturally. Kajas Kalas, Prime Minister of Estonia to CNN, if true, it shows Putin will eliminate opponents and that scares anyone who's thinking of expressing opinion different than his. British MP Alicia, uh, Alicia Kearns, the chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee, tweeted, The speed at which the Russian government has confirmed Prigozhin was on the plane that crashed on a flight from Moscow to St. Petersburg to tell us everything we need to know. Reports Russian air defense shot down the plane suggest Putin is sending a very loud message. For Putin, there is one unforgivable sin, the betrayal of Putin and Russia. He hunts down those he perceives to be traitors, including on British shores, such as Alexander Litvinenko and Sergei Skripla, or Skripal. Now, Rogozin has been added to the list, ending Putin's humiliation. Pavel Luzin, an expert with U.S. think tank the Center for European Policy Analysis, said that regardless of whether Putin ordered the plane's destruction, this event demonstrates that Russian elite is not united, and that the contradictions within the Kremlin are growing, that the co coordination between the different branches within Russian leadership is really bad, and in the end, if Vladimir Putin is so powerful, why didn't he arrest Prigozhin? Russia's investigation committee, which probed serious crimes, said it opened an investigation into the crash and has a civil aviation authority looking into it. The plane showed no sign of problem until the precipitous drop in its final 30 seconds, according to the flight tracking data. The Brazilian Embraer Legacy 600 model of executive jet that crashed has only recorded one accident over 20 years of service. And they're definitely going to want to make sure people know that this was not due to a mechanical fa fa failure, I'm sure. Uh -huh. In a 2008 Brazilian Air Force report blamed two U.S. pilots, traffic controls, and faulty communications for a mid-air collision, while a lawyer for the pilots said individual air traffic controllers and flaws in British air traffic control system caused the accident. And Burr said it had compiled with, complied with the international sanctions imposed on Russia and had not provided maintenance for the aircraft since 2019. So maybe it just crashed because it had no maintenance. Okay, sure. Mm, all in both holding this in the side were just incidental. Yeah, hundred percent incidental. Planes crash all the time. Or you could have faked it, right? You could have not even been on the plane, just skipped out of the country somewhere. He's in yeah. hiding. But the fact that they've they've always said already said he's died without even like 
it was Wednesday night and they've already said, oh, he was totally on there. Have you looked at the bodies? And, no, and but why, he was totally on that plane, 100%. Why, you know? why would he be on a plane? I would get, I would definitely have a parachute. But again, he really does definitely not necessarily can parachute off a plane that's in a free fall. <laughs> that's not easy to do. Yeah, it's hard to get I out. I think it's almost impossible. Um, yeah. Your story. Well, we I got films of it going one, down. That's my longest story. We got films of it going down anyway. Well, here's a short story. This is our, our tropical storm before we get to the squeal of fortune. Tropical storm Franklin has arrived, and here are the 20, 23 Atlantic hurricane names. This is from the Fredericksburg.com, and that reporter's name is obscured by a pay for this site thing. <laughs> and so I can't read it. All right. The 2023 Atlantic hurricane season here as the storm goes through the season. Here's a look at the 21 storm names for the World Meteorological Organization. The names encompass almost every letter of the alphabet, leaving out Q, U, X, Y, and Z. These are going to wonder why and how they name them. Well, here's a little backstory. This year's primary list of names is largely borrowed from 2017 storm names. Rotate. Storm names rotate every six years a feature that began in 1979. However, storms that were particularly destructive and deadly may be retired if the World Meteorological Organization, an agency of the United Nations, votes to do so. In the case of this cycle, Harvey, Irma, Maria, and Nate were retired from the 2017 list. In its place were Harold, Adelia, Margo, and Nigel, our good old friend Nigel. The, the World Meteorological Association also names storms for other parts of the world as well. So here's a list of the ones that were used this year. Uh, Arlene was used, Brett was used. Brett developed in open tropical waters of the Atlantic Ocean on June 19th. The storm forming this far east is very unusual for this time of the year. Only Tropical Storm Anna in 1979, Tropical Storm Bernie, Bonnie in 16, and Tropical Storm Elsa are among the small number of systems that has formed in this area. Cindy, Cindy made history when it turned into a tropical storm on June 22nd, 2023, becoming the first year on record where two named storms developed in the main development region of the Atlantic Ocean in the month of June. So it's already a record setting season by the time Cindy hit. The main development region in the area from the Lesser Antilles east to North Africa, typically between 10 and 25 degrees north latitude, blah, blah, blah. Hurricane Don or Tropical Storm Don developed as a subtropical storm on Friday, July 14th between Bermuda and the Azores Island chain. Emily was used, but not a storm. Franklin is in progress. Franklin formed as a tropical storm on August 20th. Gert formed on August 21st at the time. It was the only, it was one of three actively spinning tropical storms in the Atlantic. Harold is also used, formed as a tropical storm on August 21st, uh, three days ago. According to Philip Klotzman of Colorado State University, Harold was a fourth named hurricane storm to develop in less than 40 hours setting the Atlantic Hurricane Basin record. So four named storms in less than 40 hours. And the storms yet to be named Adelia, Jose, Katya, Lee, Margo, Nigel, Ophelia, Philippe, Rena, Sean, Tammy, Vince, and Whitney. That is our short and sweet story of the remaining of the hurricane season, which is getting going really good. So that's some news on what we're going, the, the names we're going to get soon, I guess. And we're still holding yep, out for not Nigel, right? Ma'am. <laughs> Earlier, <laughs> we were speaking about the BRICS committee and how India was currently there as their probe landed on the south side of the moon. And now let's talk about which new countries are getting admitted into the BRICS block. This is from Agence France Press in Johannesburg. 
The five BRICS nations, Brazil, Russia, India, and China in South Africa, have announced the admission of six new countries for next year as the club of large and populous emerging economies seek to reshape the global order. I welcome it, honestly. I want to see how different this new world order will be because I've been living in a post-Cold War one, I guess. I want to see South Africa, China, Brazil, and Russia play together. Uh, yeah, it'll be interesting. The world's already ending, so you might as well just start throwing your cards on the board. Argentina, Ethiopia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and the UAE are to become full members from the 1st of January 2024. The group announced at its summit in South Africa. This okay. membership expansion is historic, said the Chinese President Xi Jinping, whose country is the most powerful in the group of non-Western states that represents a quarter of the world's economy. The expansion is also a new starting point for BRICS cooperation. It will bring new vigor to the BRICS cooperation mechanism and further strengthen the force for the world peace and development. The what, Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed held what is called a great moment for his country. Ethiopia stands ready to cooperate with all for an exclusive and prosperous global order, he said on Twitter. I'm not going to say X. Fuck you. Calls to enlarge the BRICS had dominated okay, social agenda. media. Yeah. At its three-day summit in Johannesburg and exposed divisions among the bloc over the pace and criteria for admitting new members. But the group, which makes decisions by consensus, had agreed on the guiding principles, standards, and criteria procedures of the BRICS suspension process, said the South African President C Cyril Rampofos, Rampof Ramaphosa, Ramaphosa. Nearly two dozen countries had formally applied to join the club from across the global south, a broad term for referring to non-Western nations. No, it also, refers, uh, it also refers to countries that aren't in the North, Northern Hemisphere. That's why it's called the Global South. It's not that deep, guys. It's pretty literal. <laughs> it also refers to non-Western nations. You know, West is just a point of view because if you keep going West, you'll end up in Japan. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> we all understand that these are, uh, these are societal, societal. What are they called? Oh, I can't think of the word right now. But they're not real, right? They're terms we use to try to understand our world, but they don't mean actual borders or actual anything. Okay. But it is famously well known that the Western countries are the most prosperous. They have all of the. They're the blame for all of global warming, you know? And the Global yep. South is the one that's been colonized, has been gone through several different civil wars and conflicts because of outside, sometimes outside influences saying, hey, this guy's your president now, and then the military saying, no, he's not our president, we didn't vote for him, and then they vote for a president, and then that another outside country doesn't like that president, and so that happens all the time in many countries in South America, in Africa, and the rest of the global south. Okay. How long before they so, kick Russia out? Yeah, right. So Russia is probably definitely the black the black sheep in this uh, this un united front, the BRICS nations, because what I believe is happening here is they're trying to make a counter EU. Counter oh, no, UN. Counter, counter G7. But. Yeah. Count, they're they're trying to counter the other powers that are currently the heads that we s listen to when they speak, okay? Uh, even the G7 is, a, is an economic thing with mm. uh, democracies, basically. Yeah. And this was not democracies, decidedly. Maybe a few, but. I don't it's think. Not, I don't it's think. It's not this required. Is, I don't think this is Cold War based. I don't think this is political based. No, this it's is economic based. Economic based. Trade. China is economically not communist. They haven't been for a very long time. They're a capitalist oh. dictatorship for the most part. They have a dude yeah. who says, I'm in power, but they still want to make money. So <laughs> you don't make money in communism. Sorry. China's China's one big southern plantation is what it yeah. is. Where people the, work for the common good of I'm not the exactly state. sure how no. South Africa works, but they do have presidents. They do elect presidents. So. They have elections. They even, and Ethiopia, you know, I think, also has that. Ethiopia is one of the Ethiopia only African countries a, that never got e colonized. It's a democracy. They're special democracy. in that way. 
and uh, who else were we looking at again? Um, yeah, we've got Egypt. Egypt is famously UAE is a kingdom. Yeah, UAE is also famously Saudi Arabia is a kingdom. Iran Argentina, is a where all the Nazis ran away to. So, not saying that these are bad countries or that the history is Iran's anything, in there, right? But huh? Iran, Iran's in there. Uh, Iran as well, yes. That's these a are all countries for. I won't. Okay, let's not say they're all countries, but. Most, some of yeah. these countries are very famous for being black sheep, treated badly, South Human Africa, uh, Iran is constantly being put as the bad guy, especially in uh, Western Human media. rights, human rights, human yeah. rights. All these places were on them for human rights. UAE, Turkey, human I'm rights. I'm sure Turkey would probably be interested in joining this union, but they're too busy trying to join the EU, even oh, yeah. though they probably will never get in it after would their just, elections. It, in 2000 turkey's not in the eu but they are in nato yeah. so, so there's so if yeah, they're so in nato is, and they this join is in a way counter nato counter un counter g7 just all of those things that people, just trying the to western, get people that the western countries are in right the, the BRICS scratch. union is trying to be an alternate power to that which not could that cause country. something bad in the future because as right. you know when there's two power global powers that want to that have alternate views they end up fighting each other and then you have a world war that's what happened in world war one and that's what happened in world war two famously china. Axis versus allies right i can so, see china driving this i don't know if Number china one. will want to start a war they don't they're not really a militaristic country no, I, I think, think russia economically... will try to push a war and then try to convince china to join in because they have the biggest population and then of course india also has the biggest population and india definitely has a military so we'll see what happens there i'm not saying the world's gonna end but oh, there's a reason a this country alliance. these countries are coming together yeah. and it's not just simply because they're the global south that's it. That's reaction to G7, but they're not yeah. going to try to. They're not going to try to poach NATO nations either. That's what yeah. I'm saying. All right. Yeah. I don't know if you're done yet, but I no, was interrupting I'm not. You uh, about crazy. 50 other heads of state and government attended the summit, underscoring what BRICS leader says is the attractiveness of its message. Yeah, it has. That doesn't have the U.S. in it. I think is probably the attractiveness of the message. <laughs> the U.S. officials have played down the likelihood of BRICS emerging as a geopolitical rival. Of course, they would, because if you say, "Oh, these guys are a threat." you give them the power of being a threat. If you just completely deny that they're a problem, they'll never be a problem, right? Describe the bloc as a highly diverse collection of countries containing both friends and rivals. This is true. There's no reason for South Africa to attack anybody. <laughs> to be fair, South Africa's always been an ally to the West. They're basically a Western country that happens to be on the global South. US, US officials have played down the likelihood of BRICS emerging. Oh, sorry. The BRICS are a des desperate mix of big and small economies, democratic and authoritarian states, and the candidates seeing membership and those admitted to the club also reflects this variety. But despite differences, BRICS leaders expressed a common belief that the international system was dominated by Western states and institution and was not serving the interests of developing nations. I can agree with that. The Brazilian President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva said that the admission of six new members, the bloc would represent 46 of the world's population and an even greater share of its economic output, mostly because of India and China, which have the biggest populations. <laughs> uh, the summit underlined the divisions with the West over the war in Ukraine and supported the Russian envoys from its BRICS partnership at the time of global isolation. South Africa, China, and India have not condemned Russia's invasion, but Brazil has refused to join the Western nations in sending arms to Ukraine or imposing sanctions on Moscow. But South Africa can arrest Putin as a war criminal, so it's not like it's a hundred percent we're on their side or anything like that. Your story. Okay. On back to the squeal of fortune. Uh, we're gonna cover this story from Axios and our squeal of fortune winner today, as we said before, was Yaskil. Yaskil Tavares. You know, picked a fine time to leave me, Yaskil, he says Donald Trump. Ironically, as it is the squeal of fortune, he is actually appears to have squealed <laughs> already. So we we actually, I, I, I want to remind you, take his name off the wheel because we can't be given the same name every day after day, right? Anyway, or I can just take him off. A key witness in former President Trump's classified documents case, this is from Axios writer uh, 
Sahin Harbashian, Harbashian, I think that's Armenian. A key witness for him, President Trump's classified documents case retracted his prior false testimony after hiring a new lawyer and ditching the one paid for by the Trump PAC, prosecutor said Tuesday, because there's a conflict of interest. Go ahead and testify. We'll pay for the lawyer. <laughs> say what we want you to say. In other words, the Justice Department. What's that? Oh, Yaskiel has left the wheel. The Justice Department court filing in Florida reveals that an investigation by federal grand jury on Washington, D.C., which ultimately led to Trump and his co-defendants being charged in the Florida case, was completed on August 17th. The federal charges brought against Trump last month relied largely on the testimony of a Mar-a-Lago employee identified in the mirror reports as IT worker Yaskil Tavares, whom prosecutors allege was asked to delete surveillance footage subpoenaed by investigators. Immediately after receiving new counsel, Tavares changed his testimony and provided information implicating Trump. Way to go. So he's already squealed. Love this guy. Carlos de Oliveira and aide Walt Nauta, two other co-conspirators in the Mar-a-Lago documents case. Between the lines, I'm sorry, don't read that. It is not unusual of campaigns to pay their staff's legal costs, but prosecutors appear to see potential conflicts of interest in Trump's dealings with witnesses, Axiel Zachary Basu reports. The superseding indictment alleged that June 22nd, Mar-a-Lago Deputy Manager Dio Lovera pulled aside another employee at Trump's Florida residence, identified in media, in media reports as Tavares, and asked for their con conversation to remain private. Trump, Nada, and Oliveira deny any wrongdoing, and each have pleaded not guilty to all charges in the case. That is your story, short and sweet. We don't want to get this guy in too much trouble because he's already squealing to the feds. Your story. <laughs> Okay, well, since that one was short and sweet, let's talk long and, and, uh, and, I don't know, detailed about why Germany is so obsessed with 1980s Italo pop. La mm. do, 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 oh, I don't know how to say that. Ouch, Vita. I don't know how to speak Italian. This is from Angelica Frey on The Guardian, and this is our cultural, our culture-based article for today. Rolling Hills, checkered tablecloths, the saturated hue of an apero spritz, and the leaning tower. This is what Italy looks like to the many non-Italians. Now add some music. Chances are it's something like Prickly over oversaturated Sar Percha Ti Amo by Ricci e Poverti. You have a soundtrack that is always the same. For many people, this is Italy. Indie musician, composer, and singer Francesco Wilkings tells me over the phone. Oh yeah. Like that, like, do, 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 like that. I don't know what instrument that is. Accordion, concertina. Accordion, maybe, or something like that, yeah. Oh, I think that's French, is the accordion. No, concertina, I think, is. Yeah, concertina. Oh, yeah, okay. Wilking, who grew up in Germany to an Italian mother and a German father, sought a different type of Italian sound, more melodically subdued, less camply sentimental, taking the inspiration from the poetry of singer-songwriters such as Luisio Battisti and Fabrizio De Andre, and set up Cucci Gang. Cucci Gang, sorry, not Cucci Gang. Cucci Gang, a band projecting project covering German songs from the 1980s and songs by contemporary German indie bands in Italian. The self-titled debut, debut came out to critical acclaim in 2020, climbing to number 34 in the German al album charts, and its follow-up, Fellini, came out earlier this year. Bridge Gang is, a, is at the vanguard of a curious revival of 80s Italo-pop in Germany in the 2020s. Some of it is driven by serious engagement with the genre's history and the musicality of the Italian language, some of it driven by pure nostalgia. Yeah, I think, I don't remember, I watched a YouTube video about this before, but it was a video about why, for example, Italian pop and Japanese pop sound much more pleasing to the ear than, like, German mm -hmm. or English pop, right? Like, it flows better, it sounds more melodic, and that's because of how the uh -huh. languages work. Italian is much more flowy, and it's, the, it's a dialect that just leads to 
more rhyming schemes and more kind of like rhythmic in the voice. So that's, I think, why Italian opera, of course, is very popular. And probably Italian pop is also very popular. You can't really hear that, but I get I get what you're going for. That's the typical Italian it? music you're thinking of, yeah. You hear it? It's a bit fragmented, but I think I think the viewers heard it a little bit. Okay. Yeah, that's what they're, they're talking uh, about. Yeah. I'll dance to it. In 2022, Bavarian Italian pop act Roy Bianco and the Abrunzati Boys topped the German album charts with the album Milligrassi, ousting the Red Hot Chili Peppers. The same summer, German Rolling Stone columnist and music musician Eric Pfeil entered Dear Spiegel's bestseller list with Azuro, a guide cum essay collection celebrating the 100 Italian songs that it places in their cultural and historical context. Walk through the fashionable quarters of Berlin this August, and you won't be able to move for hip Germans wearing t-shirts, tote bags, or tennis socks in the 80s color schemes bearing the words Amore, the name of the new colon store specializing in food and fashion, De Italia. On, the he the on their headphones... Yeah. It's Amore. <laughs> yeah, exactly. On their headphones, they might be listening to Toscana Fanboys, a duet by German dancehall singer Peter Fox and 84-year-old canzone legend Adriano Celentano released in May this year. Not all songs blaring out of German speakers over the last two summers have been so tongue-in-cheek and culturally erudite. German-Italian singer Giovanni Zarella's Per Sempre, decidedly unironic crooner style covers international hits such as Robbie Williams' Angel and Michael Bublé's Home, climbed to the top of the German charts last August. One position higher than his 2019 homage homage to German Slonger Slacher Slacher? Oh, I don't know. That's that's how you'd say it in Dutch. I don't know German. I only know Dutch. Italians, Roland, Kaiser, and Wolfgang Petri. Even Sarah Perche Tiamo is back in the charts in Austria, Germany, and Switzerland after going viral on TikTok. Here's a little snippet of Roy Bianco and De. Abru Zanti's music that I will play from. Okay, that's enough of that. It's a bit too poppy for me, but I see where people might like it. It's very, it sounds very positive and happy. I mean, it's Italian, so Italians always sound happy. Have you ever met a depressed Italian? I haven't. <laughs> angry, angry Italian. Yeah. But not depressed, right? If somebody's yeah. speaking to an Italian, they have to be sound, they sound uplifted, okay? And I'm sure Germany uh, needs that because German is famously very, a very dour. emotionally closed off country. Uh, I think in the, dour I think it was in the 90s dour. or the 2000s, they had laughing rooms because Germans were so scared of sharing their emotions. They had to go to a room where they just laugh for no reason to get their emotions out uh so there we go a little snippet of what you'd be expecting from some german italo pop here germany has a long history of turning to italy for soaring melodies italian used to be the standard language that germany composers such as george frederick handel wrote with their liberty until the magic flute popularized german language opera in 19 1791 mm. as i just said right mm. italian opera way flows better sounds more melodic so it's just a better language for singing, similar to yeah, Japanese. Wagner operas. Yeah. Wagner operas sound like you're going to war. <laughs> yeah. In the post war 20th did. century, San Remo Music Festival was so popular across Europe that it served as the inspiration for Eurovision Song Contest, a 1955 recurring agreement with Italy over temporary workers and the 1960s economic boom that set the Federal Republic citizens on regular holidays in the Mediterranean area made Italian popular music part of the German culture vernacular. The craze for Italian pop reached fever pitch between the 1970s and early 1980s, mostly via artists signed to the Baby Records label. Uh, Mom is in chat right now. She says it's beat and it's a beat and wants to make you dance. <laughs> Thank you for watching the new show, Mom. Uh, <laughs> It does make you want to dance, for sure. Their stable of mainstream singers, including Genoa Mamas, Papas, Richard E. Pavori, and real-life couple Albano and Romina Power, embodied the idea of sun-drenched Italy marked by fancy-free lifestyles. 
Happiness is a night with a full moon and the radio on. A happy birthday call full of little hearts. All Banyo and Power sang in Feliciata. Felicita. Felicita. A monster mm -hmm. hit that spent 40 weeks in German charts in 1982. I'm trying my best to speak germ uh, to speak Italian here. Right. Baby records came at the right time, at the right place. Just when disco started gaining popularity, says music. Popularity. Why did I say it like that? <laughs> I'm speaking too much <laughs> Italian. I'm starting to speak with a weird Italian accent. Says music scholar, producer, and curator Beppe Savoni whose Instagram project Disco Bambino is an ever-evolving digital archive of Italian pop and disco between the 70s and 80s. All right, this article goes for a long time. I didn't know it was going to go this long, but let's just let's just end it there with Why do you are listening to Italian pop. Italian pop is going to be storming your nearest German town, so get ready for foreigners and also specifically Germans have a lot of things for Italians and are really clear politicals, corruptions, all the things that don't work. They don't exist. And Italy for them is just a beautiful country. Every day only because it's of walking on the beach, eating pizza, drinking wine, and all the beauty. And for Italians living in Italy, all this beauty does not exist. So while it might be a romanticized view of Italy for the Germans, Italy is like, this is not actually how Italy is, but thank you for thinking it's that great and glorious. Good not luck. Not even Venice? Not even Venice? Yeah. Venice no, no, is everyone's romantic. like, I mean, let's be honest here, right? Tourists see a total different aspect of a country than yeah. actual people living in the country every day. Of course. When I take you, course. if you come it's, to the Netherlands, you see tulips and windmills. No, oh, how beautiful. Look at the, you know, canals. Yeah. Let's go on a boat. In reality, mm. it's not like that, right? You kind of get used to seeing the windmills and the canals are an everyday occurrence in your life. So it, does, it loses American its visitor. romanticism, so to say. And American visitors see Disney World and go home. Yeah. <laughs> That's my story. Uh, on to this right. day in history. All right. This day in history. And uh, rolling through history. And this day in 410, Alaric, chief of the Visigoths, led an army into Rome, an event that symbolizes the fall of the Western Roman Empire. So it was like the beginning of the end for the Roman Empire. And 410, speaking of Italy. You stopped being relevant in 410. Anyway. <laughs> you stopped being relevant. <laughs> Just kidding. 1572, the massacre of St. Bar Bartholomew's Day. Which, did you know today is St. Bartho Bartholomew's Day? I just learned that. Plotted by Catherine de Michi against the French Huguenots, was carried out by Roman Catholic nobles and other citizens. Again, in Italy. Wait, no, it's in France. It was the French Huguenots. Okay. 1803. Irish revolutionary James Napper Candy, a popular hero, immortalized in the Irish, ba the Irish ballad, The Wearing of the Green, died in France on this day in 1803. In 1814, during the War of 1812, British forces captured Washington, D.C. and burned various government buildings. Notably, the Capitol and the Executive Mansion, now known as the White House. So, in this day in history, Washington, D.C. was in the hands of the British. 1821. Oh, wait, and famously, the, wasn't the White House actually made out of brick? So, it wasn't even a White House back then. It was a brick no, house. No, it wasn't called the White House. No, they burned yeah. it to the ground. It was burned to the... They had to redo it. They had to start... They saved a lot of stuff. Uh, James Madison was president at the time. Dolly Madison famously uh, saved the portrait of George Washington, so we still know what he looks like. And we can put him on the one dollar bill. In 1821, the Treaty of Cordoba was signed, giving Mexico its independence of Spain. So if you ever think Cinco de Mayo is independence of Spain, you're wrong. It is, how do you say 24 in Spanish? And how do you say August in Spanish? We're going to have to work on that one. Why are you asking me? I, I didn't learn Spanish. Thanks to Ask your mom. my body. Yeah. Hey, mom, 1932. how do you say in Spanish? <laughs> August 24th. How do you say in Spanish? It's the real Independence Day of, of Mexico. American aviator Amelia Amir Earhart took off from Los Angeles in... Uh, when she landed in Newark, New Jersey, the following day, she became the first woman to compete, complete a solo non-stop flight across the United States. That happened in 1932. 1949, 
The North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, we were just talking about them, entered into a force following the signing of the treaty four months earlier. And in 1989, former baseball player and manager Pete Rose was banned from the sport after investigating investigation determined that he had bet on games and thereby became ineligible for the Baseball Hall of Fame. 2006. Pluto was demoted from a planet to a dwarf planet. Sorry, Pluto, we're taking away your credentials. Get to the back of the line. Maybe you know somebody inside. They'll hunt you in. After the International Astronomical Unit approved a reclassification of the solar system. So, Pluto, you're not in the club. 2011, amid his health issues, Steve Jobs resigned as CEO of Apple and he died less than two months later. In 2021, English drummer Charlie Watts, an integral member of the iconic rock band the Rolling Stones, died at the age of 80. Featured event, the eruption, more Italian news. The eruption of Mount Ves Vesuvius was on this day in 79 CE. Mount Vesuvius in Italy erupted on this day in 79 CE, destroying what used to be called BC, destroying the ancient cities of Pompeii and Herculaneum, Hercul Herculaneum, Herculaneum, yes. And the evacuations of these cities in the mid 18th century precipitated the modern science of archaeology. Why is that hard to say? The excavations of these sites in the mid 18th century precipitated, or precipitated the modern science of archaeology. Famous birthdays today. Yasser Arafat, famous Palestinian leader, was born on this day in 1929 with a question mark. So they're not even sure. Dave Chappelle was born on this day. American Comedian, 1973. Stephen Fry, British actor, writer, and famous atheist, was born in 1957. 1955, Mike Huckabee, American politician, was born in 1947. Paulo Coelho, Brazilian author, was born, and in 1945, Vince McMahon, the wrestling guy, was born. So happy birthday, Vince McMahon. What day is it? It is National Peach Day. Peach Pie Day, sorry, Peach Pie. Not just peaches, mm, peach. peach Pie. And if you weren't hungry enough, it's also National Waffle Day. Well, waffles and peaches, huh? And as we mentioned in the introduction, it is National Maryland Day. So that's all Yay. the days, only those three. So it's National Maryland Day, so I'm in the right place. I'm in the right. Are you going to go wave your blue crab in the sky and pick some black-eyed Susans? <laughs> yeah, I'll do that. That's exactly what I'm going to do. <laughs> You're and then I'll nap. I'll nap because I will be a good kind of tired. You know, the, good kind of the picking flowers type. Or you just, I'm exhausted, but it uh, feels so good. It don't That's feel it. so good. All right. Well, then, let me do this. This has been Allison here from the Netherlands. Excited about my waffles and peach pie that I will be able to get because they do sell waffles here in the store. They're called Belgian waffles, but they're not. They're just they're not already cooked, covered in chocolate. Really good and incredibly unhealthy for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Let's mm. let's go ahead and uh, well, that's the end of today's news let's show. Let's wrap it up. <laughs> yeah, and uh, we will see you on Friday for wrapping up some more news as we finally have wrapped up what happened to Bergozin because he's been reportedly fine until yesterday. So Bergozin, we barely know him. And this is Roger for the United States, and tomorrow we'll see you for a Friday News Dump on the Comprehensive News of Planet Earth for August 24th, 2023, on Before Coffee. Be sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notify buttons, and follow our other channels, Toxic Alley, History of Gravy and Scratchy Old Records.